for me, it's always about trying to get, deliver the best picture quality possible in the shortest amount of time without having to go through too many processes or, or things like that, or pretty much I like to call adulterating the footage where people want to put too many, like I understand why Hollywood, they do their show lights and the CDLs and all that sort of stuff. But for me, it's a matter of shooting with the highest quality camera you can afford to buy with the good lenses you can afford to rent, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. and put it through a pipeline that's really, really simple. Yeah. So what I'm going to show you today is Dolby Vision, like in its true form. And Dolby Vision works for 99.9% .9 of facilities around the world as it actually is. So we don't use ACEs, we don't use any of these transformation LUTs or creation LUTs or anything like that. Yeah. You can if you like. But it's true sense, you're basically looking at yeah. the 14, 18 stops of dynamic range. And you can see when we'll cut to a couple yeah. of demos here. Yeah. There's your log. Yeah. And there's the... So you're basically saying you're grading in HDR, PQ for anything. So yeah. if someone comes to you and says, we've got a one minute internet piece, it's only going to be on YouTube. Yep. You go, doesn't matter. We're going to go 4K HDR Correct. grade. Yep. Right. And okay. the main reason for that is because, and I can see all these people laughing, right? Oh. The main reason is because if they shot the footage well in the first place, it looks amazing straight away. You don't have to do much to it. Uh, and in terms of the workflow for you in your facility, yep. You've got to shoot it anyway. Chances yep. are you shoot it at a higher resolution because they're the cameras you've got. Yep. Is it a big, uh, obviously, work or grunt no. on your facility Not to at do all. that? Or it's, from what I gather, and it's sort of just better to stick with the same workflow all the way through and then you're transforming it on the end? Well, that's correct. So, they, well, we're actually not transforming anything at all because we're staying in it in PQ all the way oh, through. Well, you, yeah. Until you get to I mean, Rec 709. Yeah. Well, you that's right. At the end. Well, that's when we, I'll talk about the Dolby trim right, okay. today. Yeah. Right. Do you proxy all your footage up before you start working with it? Oh, 100%. I'm not working in 4K. That's just nuts yeah, yeah. We're in editorial. No, so we're just using um, ProRes Lite or, or DNX of, so of some sort. So you're shooting sort. red. So you've got red cameras, haven't you? No, 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 God, no. What have you got now? <laughs> I've had Arrigs for the last 10 you years. You did have a red, didn't you? I was the first person in Australia to have a red Epic M. Right, okay. And I had the very first Alexa M uh, yeah. Mini in the country. They're not that... They were actually making Epics there because they were a bit slow to, the, to release the Dragon. But I liked the, the red Epic because I could play with it and do my own CDLs and things like mm. that inside the camera and it wouldn't actually um, adjust or hurt the, the final output in the RAWs. But the, in this modern day, and like I had a $30,000 Red Rocket card and a Red Rocket oh, X card okay, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. That was a rip off that was, wasn't it? Well, in those days, um, I needed real time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't really, want to sit there and yeah. press a button and have to wait two days to see my footage. Yeah. Uh, no, no, they basically brought our camera, didn't work, gave it to people who sort of helped them fix it. Yeah. But yeah. No. I'll look off to them. All I, I do, do a load of red, more red than anything else. Well, for me... Last five movies, all red. Yeah. Oh, that's Mark Toy. He loves them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toy yeah. does, yeah. And see, Toy for me, um, God rest his soul, John Bowering, he's a oh, very yeah. dear friend of mine. Like, yeah, he, he got banned him. from red because he, he goaped him up. It. Yeah, he helped him fix it. <laughs> yeah, well, he was, that was him and me at my yeah. workshop yeah. in Lane Cove. All right. So, okay. So, Alexa. Did I, is that my second guess? You're, yeah, Alexa, yes. Yeah, so, I, so, for me to jump from red, which I went to drag yeah. to Alexa, I didn't want the classic because it had too many limitations that yeah. I wanted to do. So my first one was the XT, right. XT Plus, because that had the 4x3, had the anamorphic shot yeah. raw, did the whole lot. And I was like, raw, 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 raw. yeah, have to have this raw stuff. Yeah. But then when I started shooting ProRes 444 and putting through the grading suite, it's like, I don't need raw. I don't need to go through that extra process for it. It's like, unless I've shot something really poorly, I need to do a double exposure. Yeah. Like, it's no need for it. So how do you, trans well, how, what are you using to transcode everything? Um, at the moment, we've got a dedicated station, which well, I've got some proprietary software, which I've written. So we use ShotPort Pro in, yeah. in the field. Yeah. And whilst trans, and the, the main suggestion I can give to everybody, shoot small cards, like 128. Yeah. Don't shoot two terabyte cards. Have a lot of them. I can transcode a card or get a, write a card off to two SSDs in less than two minutes, verified. Yeah. And then within five minutes, that's transcoded already. Yeah. And it's uploading to a server. So you can start editing it straight away. So before the black magic, all these guys are doing it, because um, I'm a programmer as well. So I've got my Synology box programmed what automatically. Uh, well, I'm mad. It's mad as a cut snake. I even got my MBA last year, right? Because I got bored. So for me, I just like doing different things. I don't like just being a DP every day or a colorist every day or an EP. Yeah. Um, 
I'm just one of these aberrations of people that I just love what I do, I love the film industry. So I'm always trying to work with different people or share what I know because if you share knowledge, um, it always kind of gets given back to you like in tenfold. So I don't expect anything when I tell people anything, but you never know, you bump into people and some of the young kids I've trained up are like really famous DPs now and all that sort of like Young Matty Fez is a good example. He's never done HDR before. There you go. Popped in there and he did an amazing job for Amazon. Yeah. And he was all worried and panicking, but it's like, no, it's simple. So this is what I'm here to explain to you guys. It, it is really simple. Yeah, there, well, and yeah, it is a bit scary, but once you get into it, yeah. Well, look, okay, so, uh, all right, you're transcoded, yep. you've edited. Yep. What are you cutting on? Uh, right now, believe it or not, um, we've sort of bypassed all our avid symphonies. We're just straight in the result. So you're cutting and resolve now? Yeah, 100%. Like, unless it's going to be um, a lot of dialogue or a lot of drama, which Avid still obviously is better than Resolve at the moment for that. Yeah. But Resolve is really caught up. All right. Well, if it's in the shop, then obviously you bring an editor in, they use what they want. Yeah? Oh, well, yeah. I've had Sean there for 15 years. They're in yeah, 16, but that's yeah, that's what we do. Okay, so you've got it. You've got a cut. Yep. You've got to finish. Then you're in the Resolve. That's right. Um, then and what's your workflow then? Well, from then, it's basically we're in Dolby Vision PQ okay. all the way through. So a good example is the feature film, Big Wave Project 2 by Tim Benyth, and it's in the cinemas right now. He shot that over six years on different countries and many different cameras and different red settings, which did my head in, because his new camera, the Helium, I think it is, mm. it actually bakes in the CDL. <laughs> I had to figure, had to ring up Matty Fess and figure out how to turn that one off. Okay. Which, uh, which we did, so yeah. that was fine. Yeah. But we had uh, VHS footage, we had all these different mixed medias, and because we're working in one big container of Rec 2020 inside PQ, yeah. Yeah. we're not we're not tainting, we're not changing, we're not doing anything to the footage. We're keeping it in its natural state. Uh, you, you color manage, so you're going 100%. in and setting a transform for all the all the archive, all the different cameras, all of those GoPros or whatever you had. Well, I like to not call it a transform. I actually just tell it what the color of the camera is, yeah. right? Because yeah. I'm not transforming anything. No. Right. Yeah. So I think transform is probably the wrong word for it. Right. So in a nutshell, um, the biggest thing that people need to understand is if you're shooting Arri, that's easy, right? If you're shooting Sony, there's like Cinegamma 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. plus all these other ones and Red yeah. Log films yeah. and this and this and yeah. this. When you're shooting, make sure that whoever's doing the notes is actually telling what the camera's actually seeing. Because a lot of the time you think the metadata's there and someone could have done something to it, you may not get to see the final one because it's been consolidated. Yeah. You actually lose that bit of metadata yeah. from the cameras. Yeah. Yeah, well, if it's getting the metadata, it will, it will do the conversion for yeah. you. Sometimes no. it's obviously not. Um, yeah, well, well, that's the thing. And a lot of the time, people don't know how to consolidate. So they're coming out of the machines and they're consolidating as Rec 709 accidentally. It's baked into the footage. Yeah, and then, no, no. Oh, hey, what do we do now? We still work with it. You lost yeah. a bit of colour space, but you're just adding that extra time. Yeah. Dolby Vision is, is speaking about HDR at the moment. It's like having a box of pencils. So pretty much you've got... There's STR, the dynamic range, and you've got more pencils in your palette to work with now. And I think it's a pretty good description of what's actually showing. It's widened your luminance range to so give you more detail in the darks. Because a lot of people just think, hey, we're getting brighter. But this particular slide, as you can see, it's the same either way. Yeah. So, so this, is a, this is a new slideshow? That this is brand out. new. It's only two days old. Right, okay. So I've prepared this with Ian Lowe just to be very simple for people to understand how it all works. But this is all Ian's work. So it's the same with colour. So obviously people would say, oh, that couldn't be right, but it's just to act as a visual representation to show you all we have is red, green, blue. Now we've got these different shades of red, different shades of yellow and greens and blues that we never had before, you couldn't see, because it couldn't fit inside Rec 709. And in the old days, when people would try to push this into Rec 709, we'd have this, what was called gamut errors. And they reject you out. Oh, what's a gamut error? Because you're outside. You've turned into data levels, not video levels. Mm. Yeah? So the whole idea of Dolby Vision is you work in ST2084, 1000 nit, in full levels in 12 bit. Yep. From where to go. Has and to be 12 bit? Has to be 12 bit. Right. Because then you get, that's what Dolby Vision is actually processing. 12 bit, you mean in the color corrector? So then if you're transforming an 8 bit uh, bit of footage to, to work in a different color space, which is what we're talking about. Where is he? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you are. Um, then you haven't got that, that doesn't exist in the footage, so then how do you work with that? Well, if you think of it, it's more like um, yeah, it stretches out to fit, and then the computer or, or some other algorithm 
you know, interpolates the bits between. Mm. You've so just got a, you've got a, a, sm a small pot, like a kiddie pool, just like a swimming pool. Yeah. That's all it's doing, it's just putting in that container for yeah. you. Yeah. It's not actually doing anything more. Yeah, but you can't add any more stuff that wasn't originally there. You, yes, you, you can, and that's a that different conversation. Yeah. 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 No, you, yes, you actually can do that, and that's where formats like EXR and DPX came into, where then a lot of people thought in the old days, just put everything as, as a DPX or an EXR file, because mm. you're 32-bit, and then you can stretch colours and push things further. The thing that the issue is, is banding happens, so mm. depending on the source, but there are amazing tools to dither yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, and that we talked about grain, that's one of the features mm -hmm. of grain is that it basically, once you uh, up convert it, you throw grain on it, now you've suddenly got a 16 bit source on all the bits between. So mm -hmm. when you then stretch it out, there's information. Hey, stop taking my slides away. No, he's, oh, he's, he's, so sorry. No, no, it's <laughs> true. He's 100% correct. Like in HDR and 4K, grain your, is your best friend. Texture. Yeah, don't take it out. <laughs> yeah, honestly, because. The thing is, when a lot of people have got these LUTs, which they've got to use for Rec 709, you're actually pushing the blacks to fill that LUT, because you've got to end up at Rec 709 at some stage. With PQ, you're not. So, that Dolby do its secret source and how it does it, no one knows how it does it, and squeezes all that dynamic range into the one meter seven or eight stops of SDR. And that's why I was saying before, uh, today and yesterday, if you're really unsure if, if you get what you're going to see in the in the windows or in the blacks, just click on the log button and have a look. But just don't expose to it, because if you don't, and that's my next slide that I was trying to talk about yesterday, um, you can have that extra dynamic range because then you have some more. You know, you can save the whites and save the blacks. Where when Rec 709 is burnt in, you can't do anything. So if you do have cameras which have got burnt in Rec 709, basically what you do is me as a broadcast engineer, I'll go in and change the matrix and dial the contrast out. And a lot of cameras, you can do that now, yeah? So like when the Canons first came out, the 5D, everyone loved the 5D. Oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread. But everyone preferred the colours from the 7D. Mm. So I made my own matrix for that to look like the 7D and make it flat. And the first person to use that was Jason uh, Wingrove. And all it was was going through brightness and contrast settings of the camera. So we weren't clipping anything with what we're actually seeing. Mm. And then we made our own LUTs afterwards, yeah? So all these slides here, all they just to show you is basically what you're seeing on these monitors here. On the left, you're seeing S-log uh, or log of some sort. And on the right, that's what you're actually seeing out of a Dolby Vision monitor or a, or a PQ Rec 2020 monitor. And that's, what, so half the battle's done. And as you can see, like it's keeping the whites, it's keeping the blacks. There's a few different examples here that Dolby wanted me to show you. Um, but half your job's done. So this is when people ask, why are you going to 4K HDR? That's why. Because a lot of my content doesn't, isn't going to be award winning, winning Oscars or Emmys or that sort of stuff. They, people are shooting good quality content. They want to get it fast out the door, but they want to up res from going from small little Sony FS5s and 6s and 7s and the smaller yeah. cameras, get people decent DP to shoot with an ARRI Alexa Mini or a Red or something, but they don't realise once you shoot with a Mini or something, it doesn't look as bright and contrasty that comes out of the can of the other cameras because they're cinema cameras. Mm. So as a colorist, they're making me make it look like videotape. And I don't argue, if they're paying the money, they can do it. That's, that's what they want, that's what they want. But that's what the whole idea of it is to work in a way that they see that straight away and they go, oh wow, that's great. So I don't have to do a lot. And basically a primary grade for me, which in the old days was looking at a Tektronix waveform with a double diamond display, making sure all your white points are the same. Mm. I do that, send it off to the client, they go approved. Mm. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> right? Oh, is that the log? That's the same, oh, that's the log. The log. Yep. That's and that's what happens, you'll see with the these monitors. Like, yep. You've seen the whole dynamic range. Yeah. It, it's well, an it's artist's interpretation. Mm. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> 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 like bones here. Like, we can see, you, well, you're showing your stuff here, you can see the HDR. Yeah. 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 We can all show it, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, no, I just explained yeah. it to you. Someone knows that it's confusing. Yeah. But 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 honestly, that's what you're seeing between these two monitors. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing the log and you're seeing that, and then when we do the Dolby trim, that, you know how that one went that, yeah. that bright, awful colour? Yeah. Well, that means that's got the, the um, Dolby trim pass, and traditionally that would have um, that turning it into that. But the way I've got this set up, you'll be able to see both at the same time, the HDR and the SDR and the trim at the same time, and then you try to match them up. Do you remember on Thursday night we showed Ben's for the, the footage from the HDR film? Put it up, and I said, I've not done anything to it. And that's how it looked without doing anything. So, yeah.
Yeah, so look, there's just a couple of examples that they're showing, but if people, we never look at that, the one on the left. Traditionally, what we're looking at, the one on the right, but in a Rec 709 version, yeah? So this is the one that we caused all the contention, contention yesterday about this headroom of the SDRs and the HDRs and the HDR display. So basically, where the headroom is, is that's what I'm talking about. When you've got the Rec 709 LUT on there, that's your stops, but you've got the headroom in the sides. So you can actually see, and as a colorist, we're working a lot in the top end because things blow out a lot. And then you're putting windows and things and all that. So traditionally, how Dolby are doing this in their secret sauce, I honestly don't know. I've, got, I've probably said it 20 times in my presentation because it's pretty impressive how they're actually squeezing all that information in. And if you just long to go, to go too crazy with your, with your color grades and push things too far, um, you don't really have to do much for a trim pass. Question for you, this yep. is a philosophical one. If um, if we're saying, and I, to be honest, I, I'm with you on this. I, I experienced this myself. I'm like, if we're saying that Dolby Vision, like taking from HDR, the same sort down to SDR, yep. that we would have graded on SDR yep. by ourselves, does it mean they're just better graders than we were? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, we should be able the, to do the, 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 the color scientists right? have actually did the trim pass. Well, look, I mean, they, it's just a thought that I always have. It's like, well, hang on. We should be able to do the same look, but it does look different, doesn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't look, not, no, not at all. Well, we've got this, sorry, what's the QC guy, what's your name, sorry? Sean. So you see that when you do QCs, you're QCing HDR and SDR? Yeah, we're starting to get HDR content through yeah. QC. Yeah. But do you have them side by side or you watch them separately? No, separately. But do you, do you see much of a difference that you can remember or not? Yes, is the short answer. You can see the difference. Okay, that's probably HDR10. But the other thing, right? Yeah, that's right. I think all the vision requires yeah, no, no, that metadata. Yeah. The way they work, they need that metadata because they can do a dual layer HEVC file. Yeah. Mm. You've got a base layer then a supplemental layer. And that supplemental layer relies on that metadata to say, hey, I can be a really HDR image, as yeah. you see there. And if you don't have the ability to decode the supplemental layer, then you get the SDR tone map. So that, it's not just a matter of creating an SDR and a HDR file and really doing it easily. The two are interlinked. Well, that's, that's what we're saying with the Dolby ecosystem to work. With the IMF, so that's what we're saying with the Dolby. No, it's not yeah, just the right. IMF. It's actually the, the, the Dolby Vision delivery to the home or like players and stuff like that. That that HEVC file yep. can have two layers, a base layer and a supplemental layer to keep the file. So that you don't have to have a HDR version. An SDR version in that you actually have yeah, I know, a really I condensed file that relies about that. on all that metadata that you that when you do that analysis yeah. and then that trim, so that it's working correctly. So it's not just a matter of saying why can't I just do an SDR grade and the HDR grade. We, that whole system of Dolby Vision requires on that tone mapping and that map information for the whole efficiency of it to work. All right. So if you want if you want to talk on that technical level, basically um, as a broadcast engineer with Dolby hat on. How it actually works is Dolby Vision's got a chip in every single one of your phones, your laptops and TVs and things that you buy. And how Dolby Vision actually works, it detects how it's a streaming platform is coming to you or I can plug in a, a HVAC 264 file, or 265 which you call MP4, plug into your TV set and it will deliver. Your brightest contrast, your colour could be in black and white. It will take over the control of every single control in your TV set and try to match it as best as it can to my Sony BVM310. Full stop. And that's why I'm with Dolby Vision, right? Because the whole idea is everyone's TV sets at home is different. Some people have the contrast too high or different motion and this and that. Dolby Vision just takes over and says, this is no, this is the maximum nit value on this screen is 450 nits. So it will tone map that thousand nit down and then display it to its best of abilities through its own secret source. That's true, because when you go to one of these domestic TVs, yep. often when you're DLG, you're in an SDR mode, and you go into the uh, advanced menus, and yep. that. there's you know, 10 different pages That's of right. adjustment and controls. As soon as it sees an HDR signal, it goes to that menu, and 9 out of 10 pages yep, are grayed out. Mm. That's right. All those controls are locked off, and you can't touch them. That's it. Which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so for us... I feel we've all got relatives in yeah. TVs. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I, I think Dolby's got the right idea. They're more colourful pixels. But you're getting to see colours you never got to see before. So that's why it's not necessarily about brightness. It's about you seeing stuff that only you can see at the cinema. Because if you look at P3 and XYZ, they're pretty, they pretty much overlap, don't they? Pretty close? XYZ is a different way of describing colours. No, but 
I'm trying to dumb it down for people, but you've got a larger scope, yeah? It's a bigger palette. Yeah. yeah. That's I right. think the thing that people uh, clock is it's it's not that there's more colours, it's just that you're seeing the same colours at a brighter intensity. Yeah. No, that's not true. Yeah, no, you're actually seeing more colours. So colours. you're seeing, you're seeing well, I, well, if you uh, if you define color as brightness, luminance, x and y, you know what I mean, yeah. x and y, mm. then yeah, you are seeing more color. That's agree. right. And just the, having that brightness range yep. extends the color volume. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so it's, but the, technically the x and y hasn't really changed because we could, we've been out of CP three you know since the, the days of cinema. But okay, but so I don't want to derail you. Just, yeah. No. Okay. Well, the thing is. It's like everyone can talk about pixels and this and that and, and how they all work, but at the end of the day, like speaking with the Dolby hat on, there are more pixels on there and there are there, obviously there's bigger volumes because if we're talking about colour as 3D space, we could talk for hours like about that, but there's no point. The whole idea is that certain colours that um, like green bottles and stuff that you had to spend hours kind of grey to make it look cool in Rec 709, in, in HDR, if you've shot it well and your white balance is correct, it's there. It's, it's just a, mu a lot less work. So why not work with something that you can spend more time being creative than trying to fix things? And especially when I was on this big wave project, like literally there's, we had 23, 9, 7, 29, 25, 30, all this other stuff. So the last thing I wanted to worry about was all these different colors and color formats as well. Did you do that in um, Resolve or Avid? Uh, all, that's all, well, if, if this, I didn't cut it. So um, Tim Belife and he had someone cut it in Final Cut Poo. And it actually did a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good job because it, I said to them, I, as a colorist, most of my time is actually spent conforming rather than actually color grading, yeah. right? Which sucks. That's why I only do a couple of indie jobs a year because they allocate three weeks and two and a half weeks into it, you're still trying to get things, they're trying to change edits and oh, yeah. all that sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so, but Final Cut Poo had a, a good feature that she set it to PQ or BT2020 and consolidated 67 terabytes down to about four with can some handles and it worked pretty well. Can you do that in Premiere? Uh, you, yes, you can, but the biggest problem with Premiere is a lot of people work with cameras that don't have time code. Yeah. So it resets everything to zero, where Premiere doesn't really care. Yeah. You try to bring them into Resolve and it sucks. Mm. So if, if anyone's working at that base level, you need to use software like QT Changer to change the time of day and reuse that media from then on. Because again, as a colorist, mm. it, it, I think the latest GoPro's got time code now, has it? But I know the previous ones didn't. But it's all easy. You turn a time of day time yeah. code to that, and you can use it. Because again, you're just spending all your time trying to conform and get things into it. And the same thing again. Then, if you really want to, you can on your next transcode. Because I don't necessarily want to work in in GoPro color space or their MP4s or whatever they are. Yeah. I still would rather transcode that. If it's got to be for the cinema. I'll do a transcode as ProRes 444 because mm. I'm getting those extra fake pixels. Yeah. So if I want to push something. And you'll notice something in the first node, if you push things a bit too hard in the first node, things start falling apart. Mm -hmm. But you do it in ProRes 444, just, you can push it over four or five nodes to get that same look and you won't get as much noise, mm -hmm. right? And, and in the old days, I used to use, um, who owns GoPro now, mate? The, what's the brand of codec that they used to have? Cineform. Yes, Cineform was my favorite codec in the world because that was the very first uncompressed codec, which was actually free or affordable and it worked really, really well for getting really crap footage and up raising that to HD to do the same thing mm. in the old days. Good job, Ross. <laughs> Would you still use if, if, uh, 444? Is that because you might be doing... Um, well, you just don't lose those extra two channels. It's not that much extra data. Yeah, so not, not necessarily because it's got its special effects. Because, you know, no. I've, had, I've had post people tell me, oh, you know, I said, oh, I'll shoot 444, and they're like, oh, you don't need to unless you're no. doing a lot of effects. And we, you know. Look, at the end of the day, I make TV commercials, and the directors think might want to change something in the end, and we have to do something. So I just like, when your camera's there, what's the hard drive worth? It's not like we're shooting extra roll of film, right? So yeah. for me, we're, at the end of the day, a lot of people just get the... Well, that's, a, that's the thing, because you have this argument, and it, yeah. I think in drama, because it's, you know, it's, it's times, you know, what, eight, eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah. you're not going to push things as much as what I'm going to push in yeah, when it goes right. to drama. The yeah? difference between 422, I've done this. 422 HQ is what I'll well, end Just up with. 422 as a format and 444 as a format yeah. is not visible to the human eye. Yeah, yeah we, we usually put the long form for 422. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's There's right. other differences with yeah. the, the ProRes 444 and X 
Yeah. 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 Right, so half the study of the, the FS7 looks shit, the recorded ProRes, right? So in those cases, you stick to the MXF formats of the cameras, all with the red stuff. Um, look, I haven't seen the latest in the DCM S3 yet. I don't know if anyone else has seen that, but I've just the stuff I see coming out of Helium and the Gemini's in ProRes, this looks awful. I've never seen yeah, any right. ProRes out of No, they can always shoot. get the R3, I know they can. Yeah, well, that's Bart Toya, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of people just shoot ProRes straight off that, and it's not a real ProRes. No, I never. Do you ever get uh, given Canon RAW? Okay, yeah, I love Canon it's RAW, it's great. The, yeah. Especially, yeah. The, I've got the new Canon camera, the 1DX Mark III. I was one of the first people in Australia to buy the 1DC. Mm -hmm. That was Canon's very first 4K camera. That was uh, oh my God, oh, I just replaced it last year. Yeah. And that's last week, that's eight years. I've got the C500 yeah. and the C70 and the C200, I've got all the Canon. Yeah. But, um, but the 1DX Mark III in particular, because they can shoot, it's like a 5.8K RAW, um, and they've got a raw light, mm -hmm. and the raw light and the raw, there's not much difference. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing a lot of car commercials, being interiors of car, yeah. I want to be with a little yeah. camera, and I want to be Ari, just to shoot that stuff, and it matches really well. Because when you're working in PQ and HDR for the whole lot, I'm not worried about colour science. Like, mm -hmm. the colour science of the cameras are all that, and that sort of similar. There's no transformation, they actually look pretty good. Mm -hmm. So it might be, just as long as we're shooting like a, a basic grayscale car, or if people are, have got the luxury of and time to shoot a Macbeth chart, great, but most of us don't. Just a simple little grayscale card or a bit of grey or something, mm -hmm. and that's our reference when we shoot. The, um, and they the will line up. The RE grade very nicely. Like yeah, they do. You can really not, yeah. most people can't yeah. see the difference. Yeah. The, the, the 1DX and the 1DC in particular, because they're digital cinema cameras, and there's a new ones coming out, I just saw now, an R70 or something, which is specifically for cinema. No, it's C70. Is it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. I have it. So, look, I think they're great cameras. A lot of people bag the Canons because the C200, C300s and all that, they had this Canon 5D look about them. Yeah. Where the 1DC didn't, and it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. But in the old days, I was using these cameras called Replays, which are an American GoPro. Oh, and we, those as well. Yeah, cars. the HD ones. And they were fantastic because yeah. I made my own transformation lights inside the matrix of the camera head to actually make them... Um, firstly, I turned off the rolling shutter. Right, I actually created a rolling shutter inside that I programmed them so you wouldn't get the bowl of jelly effect. Mm -hmm. But I'll, that turned the camera from 800 ASA to about 200 ASA. But I didn't mind, so then I don't have to worry about NDs anyway. Yeah, and so. You don't have time to shoot a chart. <laughs> shoot a chart? Seriously? Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Wait, we, 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 Mate, come on. When I go out and shoot a car commercial, I've got my, me and the Russian arm tracking vehicle, or Ukraine arm tracking vehicle, sorry. You've got a Russian arm, but yeah. you can't shoot I'll, a chart. This is a really good point to actually yeah. ask. Um, for the DCs and the rest, like what do colorists want us to do? Like, you know, what do you shoot a chart? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, yeah. Like, like, apart from that, anything else that you, that you often get given, and you're like, I wish they had just done something at like. Oh, well, like I said, I think yesterday we, we don't often get the sheets, and I think that's not a DP. It goes yeah, to yeah, production yeah. that, that never gets passed on to us. Yeah, that's right. And maybe they're waiting for us to ask. They should automatically get through. You need to know the camera. Yeah. Honestly, the Sony ones yeah. in particular, like they said, oh, Sony. What Sony camera? What model is it? Yeah. Like, is it an FS7? Is it yeah. an FS6? Exactly. It's yeah. what is it? Because I always write a little um, yeah. cheat sheet for yep. the editor, and yeah. then hopefully that gets yeah. into the colour. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Just like shot yeah. on this. Most people don't do sound that. Sound goes no, into this no, channel. Yeah. 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 This, this is exactly. I haven't taken a photo sometimes. Like this is my setup. Yeah, love yeah. all of that. Uh, but, you know, and sometimes yeah. just send yeah. some stills through. Yeah. 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 It doesn't. Pictures worth a thousand words. Yeah. Yeah. You just send a still of oh, it, I shot a still off. It looked really great at one well, moment. And make this color front like. system. There you go. You get the portable one. So you just get to throw in for free. Yeah. Send it the colors. Take over a look and send it back yeah. to you. There you go. Yeah. Pictures, pictures <laughs> are great. It doesn't yeah. matter if you've done it on an iPhone or something. It just no. gives us an idea. Yeah. Right. So look, I'll, I'll quickly go through this. So we've seen a lot of this sort of stuff. So basically, once you've got your your thousand nit, you've, and you're happy with all that. In the old days, they used to have this big rack, which was about $100,000 at an external CMU, right, or EMU. Now, with all the modern computers and stuff, you don't need that. This Dolby Vision runs on anything. It doesn't really chop a lot of power. When you render the master out, it takes a bit of time. Yeah. Um, but it, basically what happens in here, you've got your trim A and your trim C, the Dolby Vision data. So, and I'll go through a lot of this when we, I'll load up the project and you can have a look. The one thing, main thing with Dolby Vision is you need to tell it what the blanking is. So if you're mixing archival footage, 
If you don't tell it what the blanking is, it then uses the blacks on the top or the sides as part of the average levels and it stuffs up the metadata. That's a big mistake a lot of people do and that's why people fail QCs. Am I right? When they're yep. trimming. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not when you're trimming, when you actually do the analysis. And that, yeah, I mean analysis yeah. when you start that. And yeah. Most people don't see, you know, the blanking section, yeah. you can actually do that by clip, not yeah. just by the whole track. Yeah. And, maybe, and you've got to turn that on in the sub menu, so I don't know if they fix that. Yeah, maybe in 18, but you just have to go and yeah, that's right. down the apple blanking. Because if you put place. some blanking, you'd put it across the whole lot. But yeah. that will fail a Dolby Vision test. So with all this metadata, like you never touch a lift because you'll just have milky blacks. So the gamma and the gain are the main ones and sometimes I have a bit of a play with saturation game and chroma weight because with the HDR was so red with something or so green with something, when it goes down to the SDR, you go, ooh, that's a bit colourful. Mm. So I'm, I'm not actually putting more saturation in, I'm actually pulling more out. And if anything, um, rather than hitting one volt or 100% in Rec 709, Sometimes um, really bright scenes might be a tad dark, so I might have to do a little bit of gamma, a little bit of gain. But if, you, if you're sitting in that average nit value of around about 250 with your peaks at about 650 at the highest, you might let something go to 1,000, but I can't see the point. Right? Speculate, no. So yeah. you turn the HDR monitor off at that stage, that's done. No, I do, no, no, no. you do them both at the same time. So you've still got them both up, Yep. like we had here. Now. Yeah, so basically for me, so I've got my, my Sony here, yeah. And my Sony 25 inch here, and, yeah. and the, over there's my, my GUI. And you sit side by side, you have a look. Right. And you compare them on the same monitor. Stewie comes out every so often and, and balances them all up, and we work at what it is. Would you do that if you had a client sitting there with you, though? Not the trims, no. No, two monitors, I've. No, nah, they never see the trim pass. No, they ever. Yeah. So when they come and think they're working in SDR, they're actually working in HDR. They don't yeah, even okay. know. They go, oh, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. And when they get the, 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 the deliverables back, um, they never complain. And so that okay. was great. All right. But the, at the same time, that monitor is sitting at around about 225 nits, is it? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah because okay. if you've got yeah. something sitting at 100 and you got that at 1,000, you can't grade. You get, you get your trim pass and you're artificially jacking all the gammas and yeah. all the gains and all that sort of stuff up. So just this by trial and error over the three years doing all this, and I literally grade every day. And so my, my customers, that's right. my, my staff. By having that, okay. it, look, it is different for everybody. Yeah, yeah, no. So that's at 200. Okay, that's made yeah. that clear. And so they still recommend that you lock off HDR completely before touching the SDR? Because I know yes. in that kind of setup, it gets tempting to jump back into HDR. Mm -hmm. But yep. if you do, you have to analyze that clip again, right? Okay. It's a starting yeah. value. Yeah, just the trim you have to analyze just that clip. You don't have to do the whole lot. Yeah. yeah. So if you're working on a feature, to analyze a whole feature, depending how complex it is, yeah. could take an hour, two hours, yeah. could take half an hour. It depends. It's mm. really weird. Mm. I don't know how it actually why it takes so long, and sometimes it's really short. But then some people, if they really get upset with, they can't get it. And um, one of the ladies here was asking me yesterday, oh, why can't we put a window up for that? Well, you probably could just duplicate the timeline and call that your SDR. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But then it's not going to match back when you make your Dolby Vision Master. So if you're doing a HDR10 and an SDR and all that it's separate, it's fine. But in your one package IMF, then no, you can't use a window. Mm. Yeah? Um, so the idea is you need to make a creative match from your grading monitor, which is this one here, to your Dolby Vision. Yeah? And you try to make them look as similar as possible without, obviously, you can't get the 1,000 nits of brightness that's coming out of, or whatever's coming out of your TV set. And initially when HDR was first coming into my office and other people were grading it, the average nit value was like, everything's at 500 nits. So you try to get 500 nits and try to get double, just crunch it down to 100, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't matter how good you are as a colour to trim it out. I was sat there for days and I went back to the production company and said, what you were saying, I'm going to regrade this, is that okay? <laughs> And I did. Yeah. And I, I spent a day just trying up their grades. Otherwise, I would have spent five days trying to trim it. Mm. And when they saw it back, they said, no, we're very happy with that. So sometimes as a colorist, you need to put your foot down and say, hey, look, this isn't right. As a, as a finishing colorist anyway. Yeah. And, this, and be in talks with the colorist or the, all the other people. So this is what we were talking about before. One Dolby Vision Master makes everything. So basically with the Dolby Vision, they render via metadata to make the SDR, which happens at the, at the net, I'll talk about Netflix or some, at their streaming services end. And to make a generic PQ, they have to, you've got to render a generic PQ to make a HDR10. So one DV master file can make many, many different, different masters. And now, if it's on this one, you can actually make via the cinema. This is brand new, like literally came out two days ago. 
So now you can make your Dolby Vision Master and then you can render it out as 108 meter or 48 meter and you've got those trim passes in there. And luckily for me with my Sony that um, Stewie set me up a 48 meter one so I can have a look because no one's going to use 108 in Australia yet because I don't no, think there's any you're going to have a tough chance uh, QC in that one, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you have to go to the States. That's right. <laughs> so look, the main thing for me is if everyone wants to scan that, that will give you all the information about Dolby and what's actually happening right now and access to everything. So, okay, so say they only wanted a pro, it's a one minute thing for YouTube, whatever. Yep. Corporate, a few bob, they just want a pro res. What do you, how are you getting that to them? So if you've got titles coming up over the top of a clip and you can pound it down to it, because the title's brighter, it'll actually do a brightness drop, right? So you always keep your titles on V2. Now, even though Dolby said this isn't the right thing to do, I've never been rejected for it. Yeah. So you leave them on, leave the titles there. Yeah. What nit value do you have your titles at? If it's a TV commercial, a thousand nits, no joke, really? right? Yeah. And if it's a normal average thing, look, depending on the, the broadcaster, what they are, no more than 300, about 200 is enough, 225. But at, or if I know if I'm going to make something, if like for MG's garages, their stores, um, Basically, I know they've got um, LG monitors and I can make a thousand nits the size of about that on a 65. Yeah. So I'll get it about 800. Yeah. So when you walk past, you go, oh, what's that? And you see, buy, buy, buy. So uh, do you, <laughs> you render straight out Resolve or you render in straight out like we did yesterday to make that? Okay, so there's a brand new feature in Resolve 18. So you can actually make a, a Dolby Vision Level 5 or Profile 5 output, which is like an AWS. Um, as an MP4, I, well they call them an MP5, but you just rename it MP4 and they play. Or if you want to make the new Dolby Vision Level 8, which is like what the iPhone 13 is, um, that's got the output, but that's for HLG. So is it automatically interpreting footage formats? Is yeah, well this... Color space? If it's color managed, it's color managed yeah. and it's raw, yeah. I can... Yeah, so, it should, yeah. so my settings in here, like, some of the stuff, most of the stuff selects mini, but it's the new Canon 1DX Mark III as well. So just as long as you've got this as HCR, that's critical. And then your colour management, it's very simple. You use a custom one, input colour space, you just set it what, normally in the old days you could set that as blank and nothing, but now it wants to use that, right? So I can't turn it off anymore. Bypass not there anymore? No. Oh, really? No, it's not there anymore. Yeah, it got rid of it. I was trying to find it. See, it's not there anymore. It's weird, hey? Yeah. So this is version 18.3. <coughs> um, and that's why I've got this set to 300 nits. It's very important that you, put, you make sure you limit the output gamma to P3 D65. Otherwise you will get transient spikes which will go over 1,000 nits and that will get rejected for QC as well. Mm. Yeah? So, <coughs> and all this input DRT, output DRT, turn it all off, you don't need it. Like honestly, this, this, this is the Dolby approved way of doing it. And this could set arguments around the room or whatever, but. That's, this works, this is a tried and tested, I use this every day. It doesn't get rejected. So, and you just enable Dolby Vision here. Can you do a YouTube tutorial for us, please? <laughs> yeah, upload it to YouTube, that's <laughs> easy. Yeah. Uh, you can no, win, not you YouTube, like, can you make a YouTube Oh. Video? You can win one, <laughs> no, you can win one coming up. Yeah. You can win it. So, but honestly, like, if you want to, uh, well, that's funny you say with YouTube and film me, but now, if by making these Dolby Vision Masters in version 8, you can just upload them straight to Vimeo, and there's Dolby Vision on Vimeo. Mm -hmm. Now, YouTube aren't doing that yet, they're working in HDR10, but, um, and the difference between version 8 and version, or profile 5 and profile 8, is profile 5 is seen by scene, so shot by shot, it's got Dolby metadata, where the version 8 does it across the whole lot, and tries to make it look as best as it can, yeah? And then basically, all the footage that we've got here at the moment, I'll right click on that, and this has actually done this automatically. So it's Ari Log C. We've got some Canon. Oh, that's raw. If it's not there. If it's not there, that means it's raw. It yeah. just tells it what it is. Yeah, you can't change it if it's raw. Yeah. No, but it, when it's raw, it knows what it is. And it will do that on some of these pro resers as well. Yeah. yeah. Which you didn't use to do. Yeah. If it's got the metadata there, it knows it does it. Okay. You can bypass it as well if you don't like it. So as you can see, when I go into this, you can start to see where this thing's going to clip. So that's a thousand nits. So if you want to pump something right up to that 650, 
for retail, people love this stuff. You, you can go there, but you gotta have the consideration. What's that gonna look like when I do a Dolby Vision trim? Was there any questions I can answer, people? Anyone got anything weird or wonderful they want to know that I've experienced or you guys have had problems with in the past? Or? I get, I get like, yeah, a different um, approach to the job based on what it is. Yep. Because this is obviously faster turnaround work. Yeah. Um, and you take a different approach to, say, a, like a, a drama, piece of drama that's... Or is it the same approach? Exactly the same. The same There's no difference. Philosophy all the way through. Also, okay, well, people said a tutorial methods might be different. But um, in the online process, then yeah, you need to make sure that they don't burn in Rec 709 when they conform and give us stuff to you because in long form content, that's the biggest killer because they can't, they've got like turn up the uh, yeah, house or your office with a box of 25 hard drives, 25 10 terabyte hard drives. You, you don't want that, you want them to do that first. So if they can conform it and not destroy it, so if you're only using 10 seconds of a two minute clip, well, what's the safest way of doing that? And right now, to be honest with you, and I've been at editing and even selling Avid for 30 odd years, right? I right now would say go with Resolve because it's not, it's not as destructive as Avid. If someone goes into settings and tries to do something, it's not as bad. And same with the Premiere stuff. Do but everyone's got the different um, workflows. Sorry to interrupt. Do, yeah. do you make um, LUTs? So I like the, I mean, I like having a LUT <coughs> to shoot with that you're going to see all the way through. Do you follow that methodology? As a colorist, no, because everything that we do is always different. And when I, sh I shoot short form, yeah, right? right? But when it comes to long form, then I'll create. The first thing I do bes is besides the base grade is I'll create some. You sit down with the director or, and the DP and say, okay, so what do you have in mind for this? What do you have in mind for those scenes, right? So I don't do a show light as such because I've got my little secret sauce. So I put it, the, apply it, the output of everything. Then one goes, wow, how did you do that? And that's the little fine things like my little bits of grain, my little bits of this, my little bits of that. Um, some people used to like in the old days, the, um, the DC comics or the, let's go everything orange teal. That was in fashion for a long time, right? But this is what Warren was talking about yesterday as well. We need to come up with our individual looks and how we're gonna set things and do things, right? So I don't believe and at my end of how we work, like we're not, I'm not Hollywood, right? We just do Netflix, Amazon shows and all that sort of stuff, is I don't want anything baked in, right? So if you had to put a look at on something and it's a LUT and it's not a baked in LUT, then that's fine because you may change your mind. Well, none of this would be baked in. Maybe. Well, some people bake stuff in. Some, for his method, they don't bake it in, but some people do bake it in. They actually change their camera settings and do things. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I see a lot of that stuff. They shoot with the LUT, it's not fine. Only on smaller... No, they actually... Yeah, they, 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 yeah, 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 they actually make their own yeah, looks and things like that. Yeah. Because we're, talk, we're talking about the top end of town here, and we're talking about other people. Which, no, but you know what I'm saying, though? And they don't understand that process of it. And, and the thing is, can you explain your show? Because I do set up for mine. How do you actually... Yeah. But did you explain how to actually turn that LUT into a CDL to load into your camera? Or was that your secret source? Yeah. Yeah. See, that's one step that he didn't mention. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, oh, no, no, because they're trying to still set this up. Oh, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> um, well, there's actually true. One workflow, another workflow that you can do um, oh, that yeah. traditional American teams really like, which is the CDL workflow. So um, what we're saying is we've come up with a beautiful look. And you know how I mentioned, yep. oh, you know, we don't want to have uh, too many uh, colour temperature choices. I want the DOP to make that yeah. decision. Well, CDL is another way to think about that. You go, okay, well, I love this look of this show, but I know that I can make it warm, I can make it cool, I can make it bright, I can make it dark. And CDLs are a great way to do that um, because um, I give that whole lot pack to the DOP yeah. and then they can choose them, flip them. You know, But no different, really. Yeah, but, but don't get confused with what Ari looks are. So the Ari looks in the camera, they're baked in. You know that, right? Yeah, so there's a big difference. Some people call them CDLs as well, and they're not. Oh, yeah, you guys. Files aren't baked in, but for, uh, for, for, <laughs> for raw. Yeah. No, but most people yeah. b bake them in, so rather than using yeah, the same right. thing. Yeah, quick time outputs, they can be accidentally yeah. baked in. They're, they're always baked in, I've found. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Out of the uh, cloud thing, you don't have to wait. You can set it up on your local system. No, I can't log in. It's still no, says you not available. All that software is actually in the project server. No, and you can actually, if you run a project server from your local uh, facility, you yeah. can actually get all the cloud functionality. 
you know. So have you, have you, have you logged in? So I've tried to log oh, in. Just, so it's actually been there since day one. So we actually ran, we've run remote sessions with the essential result. Oh, no, no, I do that now. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a Linux box, it's oh, a little yeah, nut that does all that. But I'm yeah. talking about the actual cloud server system where you pay $5 per project, per month or something. Other than the proxy thing, which you can actually do manually anyway, you know, by just sending the proxies to you. Yeah, no, but this whole system's automatic. So basically, what I haven't seen yet is that instead of going going buying a Synology box or going buying an Avid Nexus box, um, they bought out a box for about twenty thousand oh, bucks. Okay, yeah, yeah, and for twenty thousand dollars, you get eighteen terabytes and you get four ten terabyte output at uh, ten um, what do you call it? ten gig um, Ethernet ports. And it's cheap as hell. And then at home, if you want to run off that server, you can buy yourself the $800 box and put an SSD in and run all that stuff real time playing through Dropbox. It's very cheap and very cost effective. And at the same time, when you're shooting, if you have that hooked to your Teranex, right, or your Teradec, that will then send through the cloud so your editor can start editing at the same time. It's perfectly designed for you. Like, yeah. It's going to be amazing for you. Yeah. But, um, I, can I go back to my, since we're waiting, yeah. I really want to know the answer to this. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to answer it. I'm, I'm going to re rephrase the question yep. I tried earlier, but I, I, I really phrased it poorly, so I'm going to try yep. again. Okay, imagine yep. you've got the best colorist in the world, yep. right? You've got the same footage, that shot right there. Yep. Right? They grade it in SDR. Okay. I wouldn't let you. No, I'd kick do. you out the door. <laughs> they, Bad luck. They've never seen it before. They grade it in SDR. They Why? The best they goddamn can. <laughs> then, yep. they take a break, yep. watch the Netflix, come back, and... Sorry, watch some Amazon. And then come back and then graze again in HDR, completely, you know, right. another crack. Yeah. And then convert it to SDR. Right. Which grade is better? We can't say what you, you can't. You can never say what grade is better. If you want to say as a purest form to grade an SDR and then do a conversion like this wrong, because you've lost half your color space. So that stops. But if you're talking creatively, well, you can't answer that because someone might like what the crunchiness of the what's happened to the Rex 709 that's now been upload up to PQ and they might like that look more because it's had some crunchiness done to it. A bit like shooting with VHS video cameras and stuff still, yeah? Um, yeah, I think I'm not explaining myself very well. So you're saying you've got an SDR grade, right? So in other words, we've got two outputs and both are going to be SDR. One is getting there just by grading traditional methods. Yep. And we're going to create the perfect look. Yep. You know, whatever. And then the second method is doing using Dolby Vision. So we make our Dolby Vision, we make a beautiful shot in Dolby Vision, yep. okay? And then we convert it to SDR using the Dolby Tunes yeah. tools and stuff. Which do you think, in your experience, do you think the Dolby Vision one would be better than the other one, which was totally hand tweaked by the car? Okay. Well, in the HDR, you would hand tweak that grade in the first place True. to make yeah. it match as well, yeah. right? Well, not match, just as good. Or, or make, it, make it just as good, yeah. right? Yeah. So in my opinion, that Yes, the Dolby Vision is better because you've just saved yourself three or four days. That's a, that's a fair in time. If, if in time. Better, Creatively, I, you can't say what's better. But honestly, when I see the Dolby Vision and I, and I grade in Rec. 709, no, but honestly, the main reason why I grade in HDR to SDR is it, it does, look, in my opinion, it looks better when, yeah, you, when you do a Dolby trim. Because it gets there quickly, yeah?